Are you ready? Because I'm not sure if I'm ready. Greetings comic lovers and welcome back to Casually Comics, the channel where we chat all things comics, from reads of comics new and old, to history, to anecdotes, truly wherever our whims take us. I am not Starfire. It's not just a statement of fact, but a graphic novel. A young adult graphic novel from DC Comics that exists amidst a swirl of controversy. It's been ongoing in the months leading up to the book's release, and at the time of this recording is still ongoing after its release. July 27th, 2021. Now this controversy has dominated certain segments of the online space. Assumptions have been made, accusations have been levied, names have been called, and also there's been confusion. There are people who don't know what's going on, or if they're kind of aware of it, don't understand why. Why are people so angry? What is going on? They're that confused, their voice is cracked. In the midst of all of this, the book itself got a little lost. It came out in a sea of all this wrangling. All of this has put a lot of spotlight on this work, but not necessarily on the contents therein. We're gonna talk about all of it. We're gonna break it down, the work itself and the drama surrounding it, because that is part of it and part of how it's being approached. So it's gonna be a lot of a lot. Get ready, get a snack. Last time we did a long one I said to get a drink, but this time I think you may need some food. Before we dive deep as we're about to, it must be said that this is not a bash fest or a lovin'. It is an analysis, an examination of this work and all of the Minutia surrounding it? Minutia is not the right word. Minutia is too nice. This is a work that has had a lot of weight put upon it, a lot of importance beyond what it actually is. It's become a lightning rod for many issues that some fans have with comics at the time of this recording, 2021. Also, if you were just in it to know who the dad is, I'm sorry to disappoint you because they never truly say who it is. They infer it and imply it, but it's never flat out stated. Call Maury. I'm Sasha and we have a lot to do, so like, Comment, subscribe, check out merch, get casually comics approved. And now, let's do this. I Am Not Starfire is a graphic novel released in July of 2021 under the DC Graphic Novels for Young Adults, formerly known as DC Inc. This is a line dedicated to telling stories featuring the DC characters, but repurposed slash repackaged for a young adult audience. They have a strong Elseworlds vibe. Some have closer ties to canon than others, but they are all their own separate things. They also veer towards and embrace young adult and fanfiction tropes. They seek and are aimed towards a different demographic, essentially. That is then your more standard mainstream comic fare coming out of the big two, the more action-oriented traditional style comics. Which is not to say that there can't be cross appeal for a variety of people, but they are aiming at different groups. We did a whole deep dive into how these are marketed when we talked about Victor and Nora, another of these entries. Now whether they land or not varies. However, as they are advertised in a space where most works are aimed at a different, more traditional demographic, traditional in quotes, there can be a lot of pushback to these works. Add to that the highly polarized state of online discourse and at times public discourse, and you have a powder keg, where some lash out feeling that their space is being taken over or irrevocably changed in some way, while others don't understand this sentiment and feel like they are not being allowed to exist in the same space. It can come to feel like works targeted more towards female fans ostensibly are being maligned, which can then lead to the exacerbation of the belief that some have that it is not a female-friendly space. All of this is very complicated, I'm cliff noting it. There are more factors involved, more things at play, but this is a general overview of some of the sentiments, while acknowledging that shifts are happening and some are deliberate. It's difficult without diving really, really deep in to sort it out, especially for someone on the outside looking in. Now there of course has also been counter backlash to the backlash, and that means people supporting for support's sake because they see that people are piling onto this book or they see the sorts of people that they feel are piling onto it are those they want to oppose. And in either case, the work itself again is lost. All of this can lead to a type of friction in the fandom space between different fans and fans and creators. Now all of this can be stirred up and stoked by various factors, both external and internal and across many platforms. But let's talk a bit about the work itself. This story is by Mariko Tamaki, who is no stranger to the young adult line or young adult graphic novels. For example, she has another work in a very similar vein called Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me, which is an exploration of getting out of a toxic relationship. And on the DC side, she wrote Harley Quinn Breaking Glass and Supergirl Being Super, which predates this line, but was described as a bit of a stealth launch for it and has since been included in the lineup. The artist is Yoshi Yoshitani, who has also done some work in this DC Young Adult line. Now the discourse surrounding this work began as soon as it was announced. You can see it as far back as December 2020. Now in an interview with Entertainment Weekly, Tamaki outlined her inspiration and goals for this work. I'm gonna share a lot of it here because we're gonna follow the flow of how this evolved and a lot of things are stated in this interview. That and you know I love some quotes, so bring on the goals. I really wanted to do something that was family oriented and I've always wanted to do a mother-daughter story and I've always wanted to do a story about a fat character and it just kind of 
evolved from there. It just seemed like very fertile ground to do a family superhero story about a kid who is so close to that world, but is not part of that world at all, because she herself is not a superhero. Not only do I have the Little Mermaid in my head now, but I mean, you'd still kind of be part of it, but adjacent, but let's move on. Tamaki is also clear about how she conceptualized this story and the version of Starfire. She stated, to be super clear, this is a version of Starfire, not in continuity Starfire. This is obviously a Starfire story where we are creating a separate universe world where for one thing, she has a daughter. Starfire is such a great character who is a literal beacon of light. So it was fun to think, what if she came home and she had this kid who was blasting punk music and was like, I don't want to talk to you. She was also very keenly aware of the love that fans have for Starfire and was very careful. She tried to lay a lot out to seemingly try and mitigate some of the backlash that ended up happening. She's not unaware of the atmosphere taking place around the comic book space, essentially. She stated, when you're writing characters for DC Comics, I'm deeply aware that there are people who love Starfire and who are protective of the parts of the character that they feel like are misunderstood. I try my best to always have a loving and caring approach to any of these characters. It feels like playing with someone else's toys, where I hope this is okay, and I promise to return it the way I found it. I just wanted this to be a superhero story that's inspiring. So the intentions here are clear and plainly stated. Elseworld Starfire with a daughter. The daughter, Mandy, struggling to find herself and escape her superhero mother's shadow. Now, despite this being explicitly stated as a non-canonical work, in some circles, it was still taken as an attack on the genre itself, rather than as something created for a specific niche corner. Reviews were left on this book as early as December 2020, railing against it months before the book was ever released, which caused counter-positive reviews about loving the book for making quote-unquote fanboys mad. And these types of reviews have continued throughout until the book's launch and after, even before some people have read it. Now, of course, that's been released. There are reviews coming after it's been read. But at the time of this recording, there were still people leaving one star or five star reviews without ever having touched or opened the work. The art was roundly critiqued with accusations of the character being made ugly. And many invectives were tossed at the author of her creating a self insert. Many comments were made about her appearance, weight, and sexuality. It got messy, <laughs> messy, mess. This occurred whenever the book was brought up all the way through July 16th, which is when the trailer was dropped. That's July 16th, 2021. That trailer was solidly downvoted and had many comments upon it. Again, all of this before the work had actually come out. There's assuming something will be good or bad, which many people do, of course, we have expectations. And then there's this, whatever happened here, a lot. We're going to discuss the self-insert thing as we go because it slots in very well to a certain part of the narrative. Also, we've been building this up for a while. It's time to talk about the work. Let's take a look at I'm Not Starfire. At 208 pages or 166, depending upon where you're looking at and if you're reading digital or physical and if you can count the end preview or not, we've got a lot of pages to go through. I read both the physical and the digital because fun fact, I pre-ordered it and then sent the pre-ordered copy to my dad's house. So now I have two copies of the book and then I forgot to bring it upstairs when I'm filming and I'm not stopping, but I have this book twice. <laughs> we start off with our cover of Mandy standing, her back to her mom looking slightly sullen while her mother waves to someone. This is meant to set the two up in an instant contrast, a visual demonstration of their disconnect and different attitudes, as well as to help with that feeling of difference Mandy experiences with her mother. This cover does its job in conveying its concept, but the art is definitely not for everyone. It is highly stylized. This image of Mandy was taken and the character was decreed ugly. And this is the image that appears on many YouTube thumbnails. It may even be on mine. I don't know. Time of recording. Haven't made it yet. I know you're supposed to make them first. I'm bad. I'm a rebel. There has been a hyper focus on this character's appearance and a fixation on whether she is ugly or not. Also comments about how could she be the daughter of Starfire and Nightwing. There was also some Night Star is the true daughter of Nightwing and Starfire, which I mean, they're both Elseworld stories, so technically neither are. And Night Star still exists. She's still out there being awesome. But Mandy also exists. You can have multiple versions of different characters, especially in the Elseworld space. That's the beauty of it. Now, aesthetics are a very personal thing, and whether one feels the character is appealing or not appealing. However, the critique of the character design has gotten quite overblown and in some circles quite cruel, with some of the comments extending beyond the character and to the people who would enjoy such a character. Now, this cover won't be for everyone. It's not my fave, but I think it gets its point across well. But you can't judge a book by its cover. Well, you shouldn't. You can. You can do what you want. But we're going to go inside. Let's look at the inside. We open on Mandy dyeing her hair. She narrates what it was like being the daughter of Starfire, who occupies a position of celebrity-like status in this universe. They juxtapose her dyeing her hair black with images of her as a child, saying how much she looked up to her mother. This is to visually separate those past feelings from the present, where in the present she feels much more disconnected and disparate from her mother. She's trying to distance herself from her, and she's doing that by dyeing her hair, which is a very 16-year-old girl thing to do, which she is. It's very teenage. It's my hair, mom. 
Um, she says she doesn't know what it's like to be a normal girl or a normal teenage girl because she's always been the daughter of Starfire. I am the anti-Starfire. So we see here as they lay it out on this panel that everything design-wise is intentional. She's short, Starfire is tall, she's chubby, her words not mine, and Starfire is slim. She's more conservative in her dress and sense of style, Starfire is more out there. It's all to visually manifest the difference. It is meant to accent the theme of the story. So some of the self-insert rhetoric is overblown. A lot of it comes from the fact that some people believe that the author and character look similar. And it may be incidental, or something that worked in the story's favor and so is leaned into throughout the creation process. The artist described her design decisions thusly. Starfire is these bright pinks and Mandy is these muted blacks. Starfire just takes over everything and you can't help but look at her. Mandy is sort of like a muted roar. It's not quieter, but it's just a very different expression. So this self-insert idea, we need to circle back to it just for a moment. The idea that the author has written herself into the story, that she is Mandy, it doesn't fully hold as you go through the story, not for the appearances that can be justified by many other things or in the narrative itself. Now there seems to be some inspiration drawn from some of her personal experiences as a base, but that's common for authors or creators to do, put some of themselves into a project. However, that has really been latched onto as a negative. And again, all of this before the work even came out. And sadly, this must be discussed because it trickles into how this work is being promoted and talked about. So sadly, unlike other works, it can't just B. Now this self-insert rhetoric was largely used to diminish the work or equate it with fan fiction, which is another malign pastime with a heavily female though not entirely so demographic. But that's another discussion, how fan fiction can be used as a kind of quick, simple catch-all to not truly really have to describe or explain what is being critiqued about the work. There's just projection and assumption of how people want fan fiction to be perceived without having fully dived into the hobby to realize that it's actually a very nuanced part of fandom, just as is the general comic part, which also finds itself stereotyped. So one would assume that you wouldn't want to do that to another sect of fandom. But we're going to be here all day. We have many more pages. So many pages. Starfire and Mandy have an awkward relationship where they're not sure how to talk to each other. And Mandy is very resentful of her mom's fame. Mandy has a keep out sign on her door and caution tape. Dear diary, mood, apathetic. It's trying hard because Mandy is trying hard. So essentially it's try hard on purpose. It's again that visual representation of how she's trying to differentiate herself from her mom. Look at her space. It's all dark and monochrome. Now Mandy doesn't want to go to college, which is very much treated in the manner of someone older writing about how they perceive people younger to feel about going to college, which some of this has that vibe throughout. So Mandy has some seemingly rational reasons for not wanting to go, like not wanting to get into mountains of debt, but it's treated kind of oddly. It's unclear if it's being treated as she's really ahead of the curve and with it, or if it's being treated as a silly teenage complaint. Now Mandy has one friend, Lincoln, who is less a character and more of a walking best friend trope. He's just constantly supportive and sassy. The way they converse is very Daria-esque. It was that television show from the 90s, but a teenage girl who seemed to be above it all. She was better than all the rest of the teenage riffraff. She had it together. Only then eventually she realized that she didn't. So there's a very rapid fire style of dialogue that comes with this. It's a Miles May Vary tone for sure. Shut up. Are you wearing cologne? It's body spray. I'm blending in with the masses. I'm trying to figure out if this is 4D chess, like it's teens trying to sound mature and cool written to a T, or if it's genuinely meant to be like Lincoln is cool. I can't tell. Tell me what you think. Now this is a non-canon work, but it does bring in some elements from the main canon. So I occasionally would have questions as to what was going on. That is with vis-a-vis -vis Starfire's status as a celebrity and active superhero. For example, why is her daughter go to a regular school if she's unpowered? That feels very unsafe. Now the answer thematically is so we can see how the students treat her. The boys fawning over how hot her mom is and the people chasing after her for clout. But narratively it's a bit of a blank space. It's something you're not meant to think about. Don't think about it too hard. That's a common occurrence with some of the plot threads in this book. If you think about them too hard or pull at them, they'll come apart. Now we see that Mandy's always had a bad time at school, which of course raises another question of why hasn't Starfire done anything about it? Now the things the kids are saying work well, such as them speculating as to who her father is in front of her and the like. So it's working on a teenage CW show level, but it's not a seamless blend with its comic book roots. And I can see some readers finding it frustrating, while others will connect more with the theme and disregard some of the plot holes or well, questions. Now Mandy has a fantasy about running off to France, which is neither here nor there, but I bring it up just because of this one line. French 
people don't have superheroes. Um, I mean, they do both outside of DC canon and inside of it, but why, why is this brought up? This is odd. It derailed me and sent me down a path of questions I probably was not meant to ask. I'm sure I wasn't actually. Now Mandy has a crush on a girl named Claire. It's very teen drama movie and it even makes fun of it in the narration. Now it's not highlighted as a queer romance. It just is. It plays out with all your standard beats, but it doesn't dive into highlighting bigotry, which some will find unrealistic and some will find a breath of fresh air because it avoids diving into what some call trauma porn. And others will just be turned off by the teen romance of it all. Make it stop. <laughs> if that's the case, close it now because there's only more. It has it all. Mandy awkwardly stumbling, trying to talk to her. She's so awkward. She thinks Claire is perfect and too good for her. You know the drill. No one said that this wasn't a work that you hadn't already read or seen, but just with a starfire coat of paint. Now there are some decent panels of how you fixate on little things when you have a crush, like her staring at Claire's lips. The art in this really varies. Sometimes on subtle detail work, it nails it. Other times people are off model or very cartoonish. So Claire and Mandy get partnered in one of those fictional English assignments, you know, where you explore some deep concept. They're going to talk about mental health and Shakespearean work, specifically Hamlet. Although I don't know, it's been a while since I've done a high school assignment. Maybe they really are like this now. If you are closer to the time when you are getting high school assignments, let me know. Are these actually what the topics are? Tell me. I want to know. I want to be hip with the youth. Greetings, fellow kids. Again, the way they speak in the scene where they're doing the homework assignment will be a turnoff for some. And Hamlet's all but, my life is so hard. Give me all your emotional resources. Now we learned that Mandy walked out in the SATs, and while she plays it off as whatevs, no big, we see in the flashback that she's absolutely petrified, panicked about what she is going to do with her life and what does she want. A pressure and sentiment that is relatable to many young people, and just, well, people in general. What am I doing? Also, the test pressure is very relatable. I've been in exams where people just get up and storm out. It's a very interesting moment every time because the quality of the silence changes. Now Mandy heads home after Claire invites her friends over because she doesn't like Claire's friends. They are stereotypical bullies. But overall the evening went well. But we see that as she walks home there's a figure watching her from the shadows. She's being followed. And when she gets home Starfire is on a date with Doug who is simply called Doug the Date. And this scene is odd. And they talk about how Mandy doesn't know who her father is but she has an idea. It's not a concept the story focuses on because it doesn't want to distract from the mother-daughter theme. And if the father was named it could pull focus and make it a story about Starfire and that man, most likely Nightwing. So this story is picking its battles essentially and trying to keep the focus on Mandy and on her perspective, which is a benefit as it doesn't go all over the place. However, this scene is odd because it speaks to something not brought up again, which is how Mandy feels about her mom dating. Now Starfire in this tale is somewhere in between her animated Teen Titans version and her animated Teen Titans Go version. So she has the whole fractured grammar thing and not really knowing about Earth traditions. But after being on Earth for all of this time and now raising a child on that planet, it's a bit harder to swallow. The idea that she still has no idea about certain traditions and hasn't bothered to learn despite them being important to Mandy doesn't paint her in the best light. She comes across as an inattentive mom when she's meant to come across as a mom struggling to connect but not sure how, so she's withdrawn. So some felt that this work was a character assassination on Starfire. Okay, have fun with the homework. Now Mandy isn't telling Starfire about her problems and the story is as stated from Mandy's perspective. So the problems she sees with her mom are amplified. But again, since many coming into this will be more fond of Starfire, they may view this as an attack on the character. When what it's meant to be is more of a parents just don't understand, despite me not telling them about my life. Which again is very stereotypical teenage story. Now there is a very clever usage of social media in this tale. We see that Mandy runs an account for her pet bird, while Claire's account is almost nothing but selfies. It's an interesting note in how insecurity and different personality types can manifest. And as we'll learn later, Claire is insecure as well and uses her social media to project the image she thinks people want, while Mandy hides herself entirely. Now Mandy really pedestals Claire a lot in a high school crush fashion. She's perfect. But she never really accepts Claire as fallible either. It kind of happens, but this entire relationship is very idealized, but that's the fantasy element. This is very much a kind of coming of age, finding yourself fantasy. Like you can be yourself and everything will be great. We see that many of Mandy's issues are because she doesn't feel that she could ever measure up to Starfire. And so to compensate for that, she doesn't even bother trying. Such as in the sports scene, she doesn't even try to play. She feels that if she doesn't try, she can't be disappointed. So she's insecure and they get it across in very subtle but genuine ways. She ends up hanging out with Claire and the bullies who are just bizarrely catty about random things like girls who wear leggings. I feel like we've gone back in time. I thought we were mad about different fashion at the time of this recording. Crop tops. Stop the crop. Even though I just embraced it. <laughs> now Deb, one of the friends, decides to bully her about not going to college and the way she does so is odd. So it's like aliens don't go to college. <laughs> that's not prejudice. That's just me trying to get information. Now this being some blatant work 
working through some of the author's issues aside, and some kind of commentary on perceived microaggressions, why? Again, it sent me down a question spiral. Are there a lot of aliens on Earth? I don't have context for why she would use this as an insult. Why wouldn't she just insult her in general for not going, if she would even insult her about this at all? I feel like there would be a lot of people who would find this cool, like that she just walked out and was like, F the system, I'm gonna do what I want. Either way, Mandy ends up making fun of Deb and this makes Claire laugh, so mission accomplished. But the good times stop rolling when she gets home and her mom wants to talk about her going to college. Why are you digging into my life all of a sudden? Because that is what the responsible parents do. No, it's not. Something is wrong. Nothing is wrong. I'm going to my room. This panel of her lamenting how at 17 most kids get used cards. I wish. Also, that got me thinking how rich is Starfire because she's essentially a celebrity. I can't tell. The story's not clear about it. Maybe she's just a celebrity, but she doesn't get paid much because that would be kind of a conflict of interest. I don't know. Now, we see that for past birthdays up until 16, Starfire always had Mandy hang out with her in the sun to see if she had powers yet, which is sad and low key awful, and also raises the question of why would Starfire do this. Now we do get an answer as to why, but because we have so little of the story focused on Starfire's perspective, it still comes across awkwardly. Now for her 16th birthday, Mandy said she wanted to have a party and she had one with the Titans. Definitely no longer the Teen Titans, the Titans. Which again raises the question, where were they? If Starfire was struggling this much, one would like to believe that they would have been around. And if Nightwing was the father, one would especially want to believe that he would be around because there's just no father figure in Mandy's life. There's absent. So again, some fans view this this as an assassination of the Titans. Now, while she had this party, she viewed it as her mom giving up on her. While, as you can see from this panel, Starfire is walking on eggshells around her and unclear what to do with her. So Mandy is not gonna be everyone's cup of tea as a character. She could come across as ungrateful or entitled, and some may find her annoying, while others may find her relatable or remember some of the struggles or feelings. This is doubtlessly gonna be very differently perceived by different groups, by the people who can actually wade through all of the outside controversy and get to the work itself, and then be able to read it without that coloring it, which is a difficult ask for some. Now we get to the staple of any kind of romantic fair, the betrayal. Claire wants to work at her English assignment at Mandy's house, which is fine, except for the fact that the ex teen Titans are there, the adult Titans. <laughs> now before this, they were connecting. Claire was telling her that she thought that Mandy was brave, they were vibing, there were flowers floating across the panel, it was all very romantic. But that evening, Claire gets there before the not so teen Titans leave. And so she comes out and she sees her with them. And look, Beast Boy, Beast Man, Beast is a bison for some reason. Also, I see See you attempt at Nightwing Booty. This panel is incredibly awkward to me. So the evening seems to go well. She even gets a very romantic hug. Look at this hug. Petals everywhere. But the next day, she finds out, or well, actually, Lincoln texts her to tell her that Claire took a selfie with the Titans and she posted it on her social media. Dun, dun, dun. Social media drama. Again, this is gonna be a disconnect. Some people who are really involved with social media will be able to connect with a kind of parasocial social media drama plot, while others who are not engaged with it will just find this very odd. So here's the thing for me. How did Claire know that this is something that would upset Mandy? Mandy hasn't explicitly told her how she feels about her mom or her mom's fame. So it just comes across like Claire took a selfie with a bunch of celebrities, which is hardly surprising. This is meant to be a betrayal and we're supposed to feel for Mandy. But if you're not relating to her or don't think it's a big deal, this will fall flat. And this is the entirety of what they're falling out is over. Mandy breaks her phone over this. Don't do that, the phone is innocent. Now Mandy hides in the supply closet at school and laments how of course this is what happened. Why would anyone want to hang out with her? Which the sentiment rings true, but the execution is clunky. And there are some who are gonna feel that Mandy is just overwhelmed with self-pity and again, they're not gonna relate to her. But her day gets worse because her mom found out that she walked out of the SATs and she wants her to go and take them again. Because it's what kids your age do. You go to school, then you go to another school. Starfire really does suffer in the story because you don't get to see her as much. So she feels a bit more incomplete and caricature-ish. You will take the test again. No, I won't. Mandy sneaks out and we see the figure that's been stalking her in the background. So Mandy goes to a coffee shop. Ooh, the rebellion. And for the first time in the story, Lincoln doesn't reply to her texts. Starfire follows her and Mandy's all, how dare you care about the fact that I ran off late at night, mom? The audacity. The unmitigated gull trying to be a good mom. How dare you? Starfire tries to talk to her, but Mandy pulls the ultimate teen move in a fictional story. Whatever. <sighs> then Blackfire shows up because she was who was stalking Mandy. She demands satisfaction. She wants Mandy to fight for her right to the throne. Okay, 
But why though? Also, nice shoes. You abandoned the throne when you fled Tamaran, but any heir of yours has claim. But why would Mandy try and claim a throne she knew nothing about? Starfire says her daughter has no powers and isn't trained. She'll fight in her place. Yeah, tonal shift. Whiplash City. Population, Mandy, Starfire, Blackfire, Blackfire's amazing shoes, and those shaded random Tamaranians that she brought with her. So this is our connection scene. Starfire tells Mandy about her backstory, which is a sanitized version of her new Teen Titans origin. This leads to Mandy understanding her a little better and understanding why she did some of the things that she did and seeing that her mom actually has gone through a lot of stuff and hasn't had the charmed life that she thought that she did. But it does come across a little surface. None of this is all that deep. It's a decent, competently handled moment, but not a hugely resonant one. It does illustrate the idea that children don't know everything about their parents and that they're people too, which is a revelation for Mandy, which works for her character as she's supposed to be a kind of general-minded 16-year-old girl. But for others who know Starfire's backstory already, they may not have had the patience for this, may have just been yelling, she's been through stuff, or they may simply find this to be an anemic moment. Now, the one sequence we get away from Mandy is between Lincoln and Claire, and it's Claire trying to apologize and use Lincoln as a mouthpiece to talk to Mandy. Also, it tries to set up that that selfie that she posted was a dare, but how? Because she didn't know that the Titans would be there, unless they're saying that she took the selfie and then talked to her friend who dared her to post it, but that's, Again, a leap in logic, and it's not outright stated. It just seems to be a way to try and kind of mitigate some of the responsibility away from Claire. Trying to make it not complicated that she posted this selfie, which for some people, again, will not be a big deal at all. She also says that she thought the Titans were cool, which makes sense. But again, we want to simplify because we want Mandy and Claire to like each other because Claire does like her, and we don't want it to be messy. It's already messy enough. No more mess, please. So the climactic battle for the throne of Tamaran takes place on the high school football pitch because of of course it does. Everything that can happen at the high school will happen at the high school. Now, why would it be here? Well, there's no reason except for the fact that we need Claire and Lincoln to be in the audience so that Claire can run up and do the whole, I believe in you, Mandy. You have heart. I love you and stuff. Now Starfire breaks free, but she's weak, but she still fights her sister. The kid who yells run, Forrest run, is both out of date, but accurate to the attitude of some teens at the same time. Now I see for the first time the true opposite of my mother, the person who only wants to see the end of things, who wants nothing but violence and revenge. The anti-Starfire, it isn't me, it's her. Seeing her mom hurt and hearing Claire cry out for her, it, wait for it, activates her powers. But what I took away from this was Blackfire saying, witness me, mere mortals, that's great, even though I mean, they're immortal too. But just go with it. You're the first person from my Tamarin family I've ever met, and you suck. Yeah, take that. She's powered by love, so of course she's great at everything. She can fly, she can shoot the star bolts, and she takes down Blackfire. Just because she's so angry, grew. So yeah, it's a bit anticlimactic on the battlefront, but again, this story wasn't focused on that. It's just supposed to be this triumphant moment for her emotionally that's being made manifest through this battle. And her mom is okay, and they've bonded because she saved her. Also, she has powers now. So Mandy becomes an instant overnight sensation because, well, everybody at the school filmed this battle. She does some PR to clear up the rumors and say that she didn't always have powers and also dispel the one rumor that made me chuckle that she is a chubby raven in disguise. The book's words, not mine. Now her mom takes her to study at Titan's Tower for the SATs and Raven is tutoring her because she's gonna take the test again because any commentary about calls that we were trying to make, it's gone. Now, it makes sense that she would want her to avoid the crowds and the throngs of people who would undoubtedly be trying to get autographs and follow her around, but because it happens after she gets powers, it comes across like she was keeping this part of her life separate from Mandy until she was good enough for it. I almost wish that she hadn't developed powers because in a way it kind of cheapened the message a little bit. It felt like they bonded a bit because of that instead of in spite of it. Mandy trained gets the girl after an apology for that selfie, which is still pitched as Deb's idea. They kiss, and we see that Mandy is growing out her red hair as a visual representation that she's okay with the Starfire part of her. And her 17th birthday, she debuts her costume, such as it is. Way to be older. From Raven is a very Teen Titans Go line. Not a problem for me, but for some I turn off. So Mandy says that her superhero name is Mandy. Full name, Mandy the Destroyer. Which is, you know, it's a joke. Ha ha ha. Maybe I was never failing. Maybe I was just becoming me. The end. This comic was okay. It's not amazing, but it's not terrible either. It is middle of the road. It is exactly what it says it's gonna be. The coming of age of a teenage girl trying to escape her superhero mom's shadow and find herself. It is predictable. It follows tropes to a T, but it plays them off adequately and some of them have emotional beats that resonate. Mandy does feel like a person and she comes across like a teenage girl, for better or for worse. The crush element comes across genuinely, as does the struggle of what to do after high school and what you're gonna do with yourself and the fear of tests in the future. The themes of mother-daughter bonding and coming to understand each 
each other. While they're not exactly the deepest, they are sweet. Now that doesn't mean that everything works. Many of the other characters are boilerplate. The best friend, the bullies. Even Claire just narrowly escapes the fate of being a generic love interest, just barely. In the process of following these more comfortable tropes, some of the story doesn't make the most logical sense. The battle at the high school. The story has also raised questions canonically, not from a larger universe perspective, but from within its own world, because it's not incredibly well defined and it never answers some of them. This is very much a character piece first. Were it not for the Starfire angle, it would not really be noteworthy. It's a story that has been told before many times, and it's not told at its best here. The Starfire and DC elements don't blend very well, and Starfire feels a bit shallow, and the Titans are window dressing. So if you were going into this looking for like a deep introspective look of what Starfire would be like as a mom, you're not going to get that. This is Mandy's tale. Now the discussion surrounding this book thrust it into a spotlight that it would not have had otherwise. Many YA novels just come and go and they fall back into the memory hole. And had this not somehow latched on to something and become a bit of a phenomenon, it would have too. Somehow this caught on in the worst possible way. Now the art is a very mild to a very thing as I've said throughout. It's highly stylized and in certain scenes, the romantic ones in particular works, but for the action scenes or some of the smaller panels, it can be very off and the perspectives can be a bit wonky. However, this tale needed a more offbeat art style in my opinion. I feel like it pairs well with the genre. There are people who this work will appeal to and work for. For example, I can see it really working for 20 to 30 year olds who are looking back on their teenage years. Or perhaps it will hit the demographic that it's aiming for. That specific young adult, like leaving teen demographic. Or younger, it may be trying to skew younger. Perhaps it's just gonna get people who collect and read all the DC graphic novels. Or you never know, it could hit different people entirely. Just because you aim for a certain demographic doesn't mean you're gonna hit it. You might get somebody else instead or get people from all across. Now this work does evoke some of those vestiges of teen insecurity and passion quite well. It sticks to its topics and it doesn't veer or take on too much. However, the core tenet of be yourself is again, and nothing new. It must be said that the attacks and level of vitriol levied against this work are kind of unprecedented. It reached shocking levels at some points. Now this is certainly not going to be everybody's cup of tea. When my husband saw me reading this, he did see the U-turn out the room. <laughs> but ultimately, it's a harmless, well-intentioned piece. Though I know that there are some who will disagree with that statement. Now you know what? I had a lot of fun working on this review and analyzing this work. Oh no, I like analyzing things. <laughs> I was, however, sad that some of the discourse surrounding this, I can see putting off some potential fans. Just whoever it is, people looking to explore this amazing medium, you may not want to get into it if you see some of the a lot of a lot that was happening around this work. Might just be like, no thanks, I'm gonna go knit now. I also wish it was quieter around it so that you could get a true gauge of how people feel about the story. Just the story is execution. None of this, it's a zero or 100 to spite people. No spite. Don't cut off your nose to spite your face. My mom always said that. Did your mom say that? This work like any work, just be able to be be liked, be this liked, be loved, be hated, be mad. But it's become a bit of a symbol for some, an effigy in some places, I dare say. It's become bigger than itself. Now I know that people have a lot to say about this and I wanna hear what you have to say. I have questions for you. Were you excited for this work? Had you formed an impression of it beforehand? And if so, was it met or were you surprised? Do you like it? Why, why not? As I said in the mom video, these things need to be discussed. I like talking about them. And finally, did you like Blackfire's shoes? Tell me things, leave comments down below. While you're down there, please do all the YouTube things. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell notification so that you never miss a vid. Thanks so much for taking some time, a lot of time out of your day to spend discussing comics with me. I always appreciate it, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. We did it, we talked about and did it in a Nicolas Cage shirt.